service. We are glad that you are watching. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click the like and the share button and so that other people can find us? And also, if you're watching on YouTube, would you share the link directly with a friend? That way, more people can find out about this ministry of North Shore Fellowship. But now, let's ask God's blessing over this time. Father, thank you for blessing us already. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world that have heavy burdens on them. And we ask you to pour out your blessings on your church and pour out your blessings on the world. Father, we pray that you call thousands and thousands and millions of people to know you this year. And we ask that we can be a part of that. Thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you, Lord, for how much you know us. You know every hair on our heads. Thank you that you have prepared good works for us since before even time began. And now for this next little while, Lord, we ask you to bless us. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to worship today. Help us to be more like you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his
Welcome, friends, back to our series, which is called Strength in Weakness. And it's a study of the book of 2 Corinthians. It's Paul's letter to the Corinthian church that's known as 2 Corinthians. Now, it's definitely not his second letter. And we know that Paul wrote several letters to this church. In fact, the first Corinthian letter that he wrote, 1 Corinthians, he had made mention of an earlier letter. And then there's talk that perhaps there's a letter between 1 and 2 Corinthians that we don't have. But for our purposes, this is what we call the second letter to the Corinthian church that's in the Word of God, that's in the New Testament. And Paul wrote this about three or four years after he had planted the church, visited the church, established a leadership in the church, started seeing good things happening in the church, also some tough things and things that needed correction. He wrote this letter when he was up in Macedonia, which if you go, if you're in Corinth, which is where Greece is, uh, you go all the way up the continent a bit and you get to the northern part and you see Philippi and Thessalonica. Those are two churches as well. And he was up in those churches in that region when he was writing down to the church in Corinth. Now, in 1 Corinthians, he addressed some major things, including what he called tolerated sin or sin that they were proud to tolerate. And he wasn't happy about that. And so he wrote a letter correcting that. And now he knew also in this church in Corinth, even though they were moving out in spiritual gifts and things like that, they also were starting to question his apostolic authority, uh, kind of pursuing other leaders and, and also disparaging Paul for different things. They were unhappy about his lack of visits to them as he came through different areas that were close. So he has to write a letter to keep this church in line in this Second Corinthians letter. But I want to tell you this, even though he's correcting them, he's addressing some of their faults, he keeps a loving and compassionate attitude toward the church. And he always does that. In fact, he recognizes that the only way to comfort others is to do so with the comfort that we receive. And that's exactly what he said in the first part. Our last message was all about that. 2 Corinthians 1.3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comforts. And he wanted to represent God as the Father of compassion and the God of all comforts to this church who will receive some correction. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, we need to know God's love for us. And once we know God's love for us, then we could receive his comfort and then we can receive his, his compassion, but also then we can receive his correction and his instruction. And that comfort part is big because as the name of the series says, we have strength in weakness. Sometimes that strength comes from the comfort of others as we see uh, not only in the first chapter, but now here in the second chapter. So we are in 2 Corinthians 2, and we're about to embark on the brand new series, second chapter of the brand new series, and let's go. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad? But when whom you have I grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would sh all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Notice the deep emotional connection that Paul has to this church. You know, he wasn't just flippant. He wasn't disinterested. He wasn't apathetic towards them. He had deep emotional compassion and passion for these people. And I'm not sure if we emphasize that enough in Paul's writings to, the, to these churches. He planted these churches sort of as a father has children. And he loved, he loved the people of the churches that he planted. Uh, he wrote his letters with many teachings and corrections and admonishment and, and repeatedly reminds them, however, interspersed with all this sometimes hard language of his love for them, his love for them and urges them to love one another. And why is that so important to him? Because that's what Jesus emphasized. Jesus was emphatic about telling his followers to love one another. That's the paramount teaching of Jesus. In fact, he said, a new commandment I give you. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And Paul meant business and he wasn't going to take that instruction lightly. He seriously was devoted, passionate, 
And he loved these churches. And that's why he said, you know, with many tears, I wrote to you out of the depth of my love for you. Wonderful language. And Paul had given up everything he had for them. You know, he had a great life. You know, he went from being this highly educated, professional, accomplished, revered Pharisee. And that was a top dog in those cultures. It was like being, you know, a, a lawyer, but not only a lawyer, but a lawyer above lawyers. He was a Pharisee above Pharisees. And he was an upper echelon leader and very influential in what were the powerhouses, the power locations, the centers of power, Antioch and Jerusalem in the Jewish first century culture. Yet, when he became a believer in Jesus, he went from having that elevated place to a place where he had been repeatedly maligned and beaten and jailed, and oftentimes going around destitute for the sake of the gospel, preaching the gospel to these cities. And when he would go to these cities, he'd pour out his life to Corinth, as well as Philippi and Colossae and the churches in Galatia and places like that. So here's Paul pouring himself out, not just saying, I love you churches, but pouring his life out for these churches. But in his writings, he expresses deep love, and that's not to be overlooked. Deep love through the epistles for the churches. Well, 2 Corinthians 12, 15 says, I will, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. Philippians 1, 3 says, I thank God upon my every remembrance of you. Wow, Colossians 1, 3. It says, I give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Ephesians 1, 15 and 16 says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And back to Philippians 1, 8, listen to what he says. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for you with great affection. That's a man who loves his the recipients of this letter, his churches, his, the people in the body of Christ. He loved them like a father, with the love that, that only a father can have, having given birth, really, birthed these churches along the way. However, like a father, he also recognized the need for discipline and correction and admonishment. And that's why in 1 Corinthians, he rebuked them, not just for tolerating, but for being proud to tolerate gross sin within the church body. I'll go back to that. 1 Corinthians 5, 3. This is what I'm talking about. For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one, is pre- as one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing such things. And there was some real serious sin that they were not just tolerating, but for whatever reason, they were proud. They showed pride towards this gross sin. Now, in response, however, when they heard this letter, they disciplined this man, but, they, but then this man presumably repented. And let me just remind you that the goal for discipline, even punishment and correction, is not for condemnation and banishment. That's not the goal, is to banish people who do wrong. It's always for forgiveness and restoration. And this was apparently not taking place Uh, in Corinth. So Paul had to correct them about this as well in this second letter. And he offers this exhortation. Back to 2 Corinthians uh, 2. Now we're in verse 5. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Now, Paul not only loves the church, but he loves this guy who is in this terrible situation of, you know, this ancestral relationship that he had pointed out in the first chapter, the first letter of Corinthians. And Paul was concerned that this person would not be overcome with excessive sorrow. Who knows? Maybe the guy would become suicidal or something. But Paul was concerned. So he urged them to forgive and comfort the brother and reaffirm their love for him. Again, as Jesus was saying, love one another. By this, they'll know that you're my disciples. Love. And Paul's saying, reaffirm your love for him. Unfortunately, this is a mistake that many churches make. I've seen it. They have a list, it's actually a short list of the unforgivable sins, sins that you basically can't come back from. They might not say it, but that's kind of how it is. 
And even if a person, according to Matthew 3, 8, produces fruit in keeping with repentance, they're often shunned and never restored into fellowship in the body. Now, I'm not talking about restoration of titles and restoration of positions. That's a conditional thing. That's a separate issue. I'm talking about a, a relational restoration back to the place that the brother or the sister was before they sinned. And this is the this is the goal for, for those that are in sin, to bring them back to healing and repentance and restoration. Galatians 1, I'm sorry, Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You who live by the Spirit, restore this person gently. What does that mean? You who live by the Spirit, you're the those who are spiritual. What does that mean? Well, what do spiritual people do? They display regularly the fruit of the Spirit. Spiritual people have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. See someone like that? That's a spiritual person. That's someone who lives by the Spirit. And those are the ones that should restore the brother gently. Not the ones who don't live by the Spirit. They'll do more harm than good. You know, they'll actually be tempted, as Paul just said, in the process. And he says, carry each other's burdens, and in doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What does that mean? You know, a lot of times we use this verse and say, oh, carry each other's burdens. Help someone that has a physical need. Help someone that has a financial need. Help someone that has an emotional need. But in this context, what he just put forth is someone who's suffering spiritually. Someone who's suffering under the weight of sin. Carry each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, we just said it. We just read it from John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. So important. All right, let's continue in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, is there, if there anything was to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You know, we should be called the forgiven people. But not just that, we should be called the forgiving forgiven people. We should be called very forgiving people, people that are quick to forgive. In other words, forgiven people who also forgive others. And this is a very important part of Jesus' teaching. In Matthew 6, in the Lord's Prayer, verses 12 and 13, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Matthew 18 is all about forgiveness. He, Jesus has some very strong language on the importance of forgiveness. So that's why Paul tells him, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan, the devil, might not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his schemes. In other words, we are aware of the devil's schemes. And the devil's schemes are pretty simple. They've always been to divide and conquer. Any opportunity that he has to cause disunity to spread in the body, he eagerly fans the flames and pours gas on the fire. That's what he does. And one area that he's especially effective is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness that leads to bitterness, bitterness that leads to disunity, and tears churches apart, and people apart, and relationships apart. Have you ever had a conflict with someone? Maybe they've wronged you. Maybe that you've been hurt by them, and you carry this unforgiveness. In fact, you tell friends about it, and your friends agree with you and they commiserate and they malign against your quote-unquote enemy and then you have some solidarity in your you know defense against the offense now both you and your friend uh you know who carry this bitterness towards that person are now affected by it but what if you make up with the person what if you patch some things up and and reconcile with the person with whom you've had an offense what about all your friends? They're obligated to forgive that person as well. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And sometimes the more bitterness spreads. And that's why it's so important that Paul says, anyone you forgive, I forgive also. I don't care who, what's going on there. I do care, but I'm not concerned 
with the intricacies of, you know, the offense. But if you forgive, then I'm not going to continue to carry a, a, an offense and if you carry bitterness and unforgiveness. If you've already forgiven, that would be ridiculous. That's why it's so important to forgive. All right, let's continue on. 2 Corinthians 2, 12 now. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. <clears throat> Interesting. So in other words, he went to Troas, the Lord opened the door, but he didn't have peace of mind because he didn't see a guy named Titus. That's interesting. Well, here's what's going on. Titus was a friend, and he was, had been to the Corinthian church, and Paul had expected to see him in this place called Troas, which is you know, across the Aegean Sea from Macedonia, but Titus wasn't there. Why did Paul want to see him so badly? Because he really wanted Titus to say, hey, Paul, I've been to Corinth. They got your letter. Everything's good. Relationship is still intact. We're good. But he didn't see Titus in Troas. And eventually he did see Titus uh, in Macedonia. And that's why he went over to Macedonia. He continued to go. Um, and when he got there, he, he connected with Titus. We, we can actually read about that in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. It says, For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us. Sound familiar? By the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever before. See, Paul's heart was finally comforted because he loved this church, and he thought that they didn't like him anymore. <laughs> Paul was human. But you see this humanity here and how much he ardently loved the church, and he was so comforted that they loved him too, regardless of the letter that he had sent. And again, that concept of comfort each other with the comfort you have given, this reciprocal comfort is very important. It's very important with strength and weakness. Sometimes we need strength from each other. God gives you strength, and it might not just be for you. It might be for someone who needs it. All right, so the final verses of this chapter, verses 14 through 17 of 2 Corinthians 2, but thank God he has made us captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphant processional. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere, like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom, but to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such a task as this? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. And again, this is, he's saying this is, we're, we're, we're being used to spread the knowledge of God. It's, he ends the whole chapter with this visual of, of like, a, you know, like a victorious prisoner parade. But we are the prisoners that Christ has, brings to us and brings and puts forth. And there's a fragrance. In the ancient world, there was these parades and, and not just sounds and music like we have now. They had burning incense altars everywhere and there's, the towns would be filled with incense. And that's what we're talking about here. But, but he's saying it's very different. It's a very different effect for those who are being saved than for those who are perishing. Those who are perishing have no knowledge of, of the word of God, of God's will. And so it smells like a death and doom, it says, the smell of death and doom, he said in verse 15. But to those who are being saved, it's a pleasant aroma to them and to God. Now, those who are perishing, let's talk about them. They have no knowledge of the truth and they can't understand the truth of the cross or the message of the gospel. So in their lostness, they're blinded to these things. And in fact, they find them detestable and foolish. Yeah, they find the message of the cross foolish. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the message of the cross is not only a detestable smell of death and doom, but it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it's not just a sweet aroma, but it is the power of God. I saw something recently on TV, and it was, a, it was one of these debate shows. Um, 
you know, was a, a, and it's an intellectual Jewish conservative who would debate college students. And it was actually quite entertaining because both sides were very respectable, presented their cases very well. It's really nice. Um, you know, I leaned to one side, of course, but hearing young people articulate their thoughts was actually pretty entertaining. However, one person got up to the platform and it was a big guy, looked like a, like a football player with a beard. And he immediately just started asking these kind of mystical questions. And then finally came out and said, I am a woman and your people have harassed us and denigrated us for years. And he started to spew this anger and he was being irate and furious. He's enraged, he's unhinged, hateful at this Jewish person who was the debate host. And to the point where the person just kind of sat there silently until this hateful person was removed. And I thought about that. I wonder what I would do in this case. You know, somebody just starts berating me, shouting me. I can't get a word in edgewise. You're just accusing me of all this hateful stuff. You know, I'd probably be like tempted to put the cross up like you would in an exorcist only because that's what the person really needs. But I, you know, you see the hurt and you see the woundedness in these people and, and their woundedness and their hurt turns into vicious anger and then they just spew it. And the only thing we could do is speak the truth in love to these people. But in that, we need to speak the truth in the face and the barrage of these lies, even if the hearer cannot perceive or understand it. See, salvation through Jesus is exactly what a person like that needs. In fact, they desperately need it. So somehow, in our kindness, as Romans says, the kindness has to lead to repentance. What is repentance? A complete change complete change of mind with, that results in a change of behavior and everything else. And so the idea is you want to get this person to change and not only change, but they are drowning. This person is desperately in need of salvation because they are, as we just read, perishing. They're perishing. The sad truth is most of the world is perishing and finds the message of the cross to be foolish, as we just read in 1 Corinthians 1.18, foolish. And they're perishing because they face, what are they facing? Judgment and eternal death if they continue to ignore the cross and reject God. Romans 2.5 says, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So the only hope that person or the whole world has to escape God's wrath is to accept the salvation that is being offered and made available through Jesus' blood. And this is why it's so important, as we just read, that we're being sent by God to speak the truth about his word, speak about Jesus, even to a sinful, hateful generation that openly rejects him. You know, if, if you're on a cruise and you pass someone and you, that's in a sinking boat and you're like, whoa, we got to help this person. And they're calling up to you and they're even if they're shouting at you and they hate you for the you know, for being on a cruise when they're on a sinking boat, you're not going to say, well, let me give you what I have. You know, we have a, a buffet. Let me throw you some of the chicken franchise or here's a ribeye we had last night or here's some, you know, pickleball paddles. We're having fun. A golf club. No, you're, you're going to throw them something that will save them. But even if you throw them a life preserver that will temporarily help them, but then you're going to leave them out in the middle of the ocean. What needs to happen is that person needs to leave their sinking ship and get on board. That's the only thing that's going to save them. And that's how we have to see a person drowning in sin and lostness. You don't want to just try to help them make their life better and more comfortable and more convenient. You got to get them out of that life and into fellowship with God, reconciled into fellowship with God. Their lostness shows you the need for redemption and salvation that they have, a desperate need that only comes through the cross. Romans 5, 8 and 9 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 6, 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is the message that will save the world. This is the message that we need to send. And it's only through the cross of Jesus and his sacrifice that we can have forgiveness, salvation, restoration, reconciliation with our heavenly father, who, by the way, wills none to perish. 
and that that all would come to repentance. Let me close with this, these words from Jesus, John 5, 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. That is my ardent prayer for you and for anyone in your world, in your sphere of influence, your world, your family, friends, co-workers, community, anyone who has, is still perishing and still struggling under the bondage of sin, that they would find release and relief and reconciliation and restoration through the blood of Jesus. That's available to you today. May God bless you.
Thank you, friend, for joining us at North Shore Fellowship Online. And my prayer is that you'll join us regularly. Maybe come out to one of our services, enjoy one of our small groups, even our online small groups. But most importantly, as I mentioned in this message, that the only thing that you can do to secure your salvation for heaven, for eternity, is to believe upon Jesus and to receive the free gift of salvation that he's offering to you. If you've not done that, do that today. And if you need some help, I'd be glad to walk you through it and pray with you for the most important decision of your life. May God bless you.